Welcome back, BioMonsters. Today we're going to be talking about sex-linked traits. Now let's quickly make a distinction between what we're going to be discussing today and what we've talked about in the past. So far, everything that we've discussed in terms of Mendelian genetics and other forms of alternative inheritance have all been a part of autosomal inheritance patterns. So let's talk quickly uh, about what that means. So remember that for humans, our magic number is 46, right? We've discussed that before in previous lectures, which means that we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And remember, our chromosomes look like this. Well, of those 23 pairs, the first 22 are autosomes. That means that they have nothing to do with your sex. Well, all of the inheritance patterns that we've talked about so far in, uh, have to do with genes that are only found on the first 22 pairs. However, today we're gonna be talking about sex link traits, and that means we're gonna be focusing on genes and how they move that are only found on your sex chromosomes. And just quickly, before we actually dive in, let's just remind ourselves when we're talking about sex chromosomes, we have sex chromosomes for males and also for females, right? So let's talk quickly about what they look like. So a female sex chromosomes, if they're genetically normal, will always be XX. And for a male, it will always be XY. So today we're going to focus on the inheritance of traits that are controlled by genes only found on the last pair of chromosomes, unlike what we talked about previously, which has to do with the first 22 pairs and the genes that are associated with traits that are only found on those chromosomes. So let's go ahead and dive in. So today, again, we're only going to be focusing on sex chromosomes, but specifically, we're only focusing on the X. And the reason why we're only focusing on the X is because it contains all the important genetic material. Um, the Y is there, and it, it has some jobs, but we're going to say for our class that it doesn't do anything significant, so we're not going to pay attention to it. So the first thing that we have to acknowledge is that there are some traits that are actually controlled by genes that are only found on the X chromosome. The question that you might have now is, how do we know? How do we know that these genes are only found on the X? Well, the way that we know is because genes that are found on the X, and I'll put X in quotations, behave differently than genes found on our autosomes. And what we're going to do now is talk about what causes that difference in behavior and what that behavior actually looks like. So here's the reason why we actually see this. So if you remember from what we talked about previously, remember that mom can only give an X to her offspring. So let's quickly talk about why that is. So here's my mom, and remember mom is a female, so her sex chromosomes are going to be XX. So if mom only has two X's for sex chromosomes, that means she can only make gametes that also only have X's inside of them. So I'm going to go ahead and label these. <laughs> these are my gametes, also my sex cells, and they happen because they're in females, happen to be called ovum or eggs. So here are my sex chromosomes from mom. But if we're talking about sexual reproduction, we can't forget dad. So remember, dad is a male, so his sex chromosomes are going to be XY. And if he is making gametes, and he will, his gametes can take on one of two conformations. The sperm can either be carrying an X, or a sperm can be carrying a Y. Now this becomes significant when these two parents decide to participate in a fertilization event. So let's say that these guys are going to fertilize their two um, gametes, so we're going to have them fuse in a fertilization event to give rise to the next generation. And let's say hypothetically they want to make a daughter. So let's say that they're hoping for a little girl. So if they're hoping for a little girl, so we're going to go ahead and say that they want a daughter, let's talk about where what they need in order to make that. Well, again, mom can only ever give an X. So I'm going to go ahead and trace her gamete over to the daughter and say that she gave an X. But again, if we want a daughter, we need a female um, sex chromosome combination, so we need XX. That means dad has to also give an X 
to make a daughter. And then this brings us back up to our correct pairing for a female. However, what if they decided they wanted to make a son? If they wanted to make a son, things are going to be a little different. In order to make a son, same thing is still going to be true for mom. Mom can only ever give an X. So here we go, we have our X for mom. But to have a boy, dad has to give a Y. And remember, we talked about this before, it's the males that actually control the gender or the sex of the child because moms can only ever give Xs. Now you might be asking yourself at this point, well, why is this significant? Why did we just go over what we talked about previously when we talked about meiosis? Well, the reason why this is significant is because you guys need to remember that males will always, so this never changes, males will always, and I'm gonna underline that because it's super important, males will always express the genes found on the X chromosome that he received from mom. So that never changes. That's super, super, super important. Now I want you to remember this statement because we're going to take it a step further. So here's where things really are going to get interesting. So we've already said this, that males will always express what um, is found on the X that their mom gave them. And you might be asking yourselves, well, why is this? So let's go ahead and come up with some an example. So let's go ahead and write down what our sex chromosomes would be for a son. So if we had a male, and that's what we're talking about, the sex chromosomes are going to be X, Y. Well, here's the interesting thing about the X and the Y. Let's start with the X. The X carries all the important genes. Now, this is not the whole truth, but it's the truth for our class. So if the X is carrying all the important genes, we know something about Y. It isn't carrying anything important. Now, that's an oversimplification. That's not really true. The Y does have jobs, many jobs, but we're not going to focus on them for our class. So we're going to say the X carries all the important stuff, and the Y just has some extra stuff that we can take or we can leave. Now, some students in the past make it easier for them to understand this concept. They also went ahead and they labeled the X, and they said that the X was the stronger the stronger of the two sex chromosomes, which means that the Y is weak. Now that's important because remember for a male, the X is always gonna be paired with a Y. So the significance of that is anytime the X is paired with the Y, the X is the only thing you're ever going to see. So anything that the X codes for, that's what you're gonna see in the actual child, in the phenotype. The Y, however, is weak. So even though it's there, we're not gonna see anything on the Y because it's going to be masked. So that explains why we always see what's on the X when we are talking about males that we received from the mother. So now let's talk about the significance. So believe it or not, it's actually easier for males to express sex-linked traits than it is for girls. And the reason that is, is based on what we just talked about. Remember when we talked about boys, they're XY, and when we talked about girls, they're XX. So let's go ahead and label that. We'll say that this is our female and this is our male, and let's see why this is actually true. So a sex-linked trait is a trait that's associated with the X chromosome. Well, it's easier for a male to express it because a male only needs one X to express the trait. And the reason why it only needs one X to express the trait is again, because this guy is really weak. So we can't see anything that's on the Y. So anything that mom gives you, you will see it. So this will be seen, okay? Now if we're talking about females instead, if we're looking at the female, notice that females have two X's. That means that in order for a female to express a trait, she actually has to receive the correct genotype or the correct confirmation. So in order for the trait to be seen here, a female has to receive two X's with the gene in order 
to express the trait. And as you guys know, based on simple math, this is much easier to do than this. It's easier to just collect the one X that you need. It's harder to collect two. Well, let's take that a step further. The reason why we're going to pay attention to the difference between males and females is because it is a clear indication of that we're dealing with a sex link trait. So because it's easier for males to actually receive um, the trait because they only need one X, we see more males with sex linked traits than females. And this is a very important topic, so you want to make sure, or idea, so you want to make sure that you pay attention to that. We see way more males than females. So anytime there's a disproportionate number of males and females, and you have way more males with the trait than you do females, you should automatically think to yourself, well, that's probably a sex-linked trait because it's easier for guys to get it than it is for females. All right, now that we've talked about sex link traits in general, there are three specific sex link traits that you are going to be responsible for knowing this year on your test and on your quiz. The first one is something called male patterned baldness. And as the name suggests, it actually causes hair loss. And what's um, sometimes new information to some people is that even though it's called male pattern baldness, it affects males and females. But again, because it's sex linked, we tend to see it more often in men. The next sex linked trait that you're going to be responsible for is something called red green color blindness. And just like with our previous name, the name tells you exactly what the issue is. If somebody has red-green color blindness, they're actually unable to differentiate between red and green, so they can't tell the difference between those two colors. The last sex link trait is really the worst one, and this one is called hemophilia A. And hemophilia A is a disease that actually prevents the blood from clotting. So it prevents blood from clotting. That's really important. So the, so the effect of that disease is that you're not able to stop yourself from bleeding even if you get a little paper cut or if you get a bruise. So individuals actually really struggle with that and sometimes actually die because they bleed to death um, because they can't actually get their blood to clot. The next thing that we want to talk about, even though these are all four very different traits that cause very different phenotypic expressions in individuals, they do actually have something in common. So let's talk about what their commonalities are. The first thing that they have in common is that the gene is located only on the X chromosome. And that should make sense to you because these are all sex-linked traits, which means that more men have these traits than women, which aligns with everything that we've already discussed so far up to this point. The next thing that they have in common is something really important. All of these disorders are recessive. So that means that the only way to actually have the disorder is to either be a male and have just one recessive allele found on the X, or you can be a female, but you'd have to receive two lowercase or two recessive alleles, one from mom and one from dad. And again, it's easier for a male than a female to actually have these particular traits. And let's explain why. <clears throat> when we're actually looking at these traits, remember a male is going to be XY. In order for a male to be affected or to have it, they would have to have a lowercase letter associated with their X, but they only need to receive one, and if they do, they are affected. If they are a female, however, and they're XX, the only way for them to actually have the trait is to receive two lowercase or two recessive alleles, one from mom and one from dad, and this way they would be affected as well. If a female has this confirmation instead or this genotype, they are said to be a carrier because they themselves don't have it, but they could pass it on to the next generation. If there are if they're X big R, X big R, they are said to be unaffected. So they don't have it and they also cannot pass it along. All right, now that we have that information, let's see if we can go ahead and put this into action by doing some word problems. <clears throat> 
All right, so our first word problem here is a cross. We want to cross a man who has male pattern baldness. So this is a male with a carrier female for the same trait. And then what we're actually trying to answer is what is the probability and probability is percentage of producing a daughter with this phenotype. Now, before we just go ahead and dive in, the first thing that I want to remind you of is uh, the way that we are actually going to set up our genotypes. Remember, whenever we're dealing with females, we're going to use XX. Whenever we're dealing with males, we're going to use XY. And we're going to denote the differences in our X's by using a capital superscript or a lowercase superscript. But we still want to pay attention to the same rules that we had before when we did our previous genetics problem. So we still want to hammer it out make a key, and then find our parents. So I've already hammered out my question by using my um, reading strategies. The next thing that I want to do is make a key. And for my key, the first thing that I want to do is figure out um, what an affected allele is going to look like and what an unaffected allele is going to look like. So I'm going to do affected first, and if they're affected, it means that they have it. The only way to be affected is to be a X, with a lowercase letter, with a lowercase superscript R, because again, this is a recessive disorder. To be unaffected, I'm gonna do X with a capital R, because again, um, if it's a capital R, it's dominant, and this is a recessive disorder. Now that I have my key, the next thing I need to do is figure out my parents. So I'm gonna go ahead and put P1, so parent number one. I know that my first parent is a male, so I can go ahead and write in his sex chromosomes. And then it says that he has male pattern baldness. Well, I know that I never have to do anything to the Y because it doesn't really do anything. I just have to pay attention to the X that he received from my Mom. And he has it, so I'm going to go ahead and put a lowercase r next to my x. Now what I want to do is look at parent number two. Parent number two has to be a female because we did we um, took care of parent number one, which was dad. And it says that carrier or that parent number two is a carrier female. Well, to be a carrier means number one that they don't have it, so that means at least one of their x's has to be a capital letter. So I'm going to go ahead and put a capital letter next to my first x. If they're a carrier, however, it means that they can carry the recessive allele and give it to the next generation. So that means it's going to be a lowercase r, or it means that it's a heterozygous genotype. Now that we have our two parents, we can go ahead and fill in our Punnett square. So I'm going to put parent number one over here on top, and I'll put parent number two on the side. And you guys can change up that order. It doesn't matter. To remind you, remember whatever's on the left hand side of the Punnett square goes in, whatever's on the top of the Punnett square also goes into that quadrant. So after we do that, let's go ahead and see what we actually get. We have X capital R, X lowercase r in the uh, first quadrant, then we have X capital R, Y, and then X lowercase r, X lowercase r, and then finally we have X lowercase r and then Y. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at my question. We're looking at the probability of producing a daughter with this phenotype, with male patterned baldness. So we know that we're only looking at daughters, so that means I can get rid of all of my men. I don't have to worry about these two boxes at all because those have to do with boys. What I am looking for is a daughter who actually will have male pattern baldness. And if I look here, the first quadrant we have a carrier because it's heterozygous. But in the second quadrant we have two lowercase r's, which means that unfortunately this individual will have male pattern baldness. So that means the likelihood or probability would be 25 percent. All right, let's go ahead and look at our next word problem. We need to cross a woman, so it's going to be a female, who has red-green color blindness with an unaffected male. And the question that we're trying to answer is what is the probability, so percentage, of producing an unaffected child? So the first thing I'm going to do again is fill in my key. So I'm going to have my affected. And the thing that I need to remember, color blindness, red green color blindness is recessive. So in order to be affected, we have to have an X with a lowercase letter. And I'm going to go ahead and use uh, an R again for red green color blindness. So it's going to be a lowercase R. And that means to be unaffected, we're going to be X capital R. 
The next thing I need to do is figure out who my parents are. So parent number one, my first parent is a woman, so I'm going to go ahead and put in her sex chromosomes, XX, and it says the woman actually has red-green color blindness. So that means that she has to be homozygous recessive, so two lowercase r's. Then I need to figure out parent number two. I know it's my dad, so I'm going to go ahead and put in the sex chromosomes for a male, but it says that he's unaffected. And again, I'm not going to do anything to my Y, but if he's unaffected, according to my key, it's going to be capital R. Now I'm going to throw my parents into my Punnett square. I'm going to put um, parent number two across the top this time, and then parent number one along the side. And just as a reminder again, whatever's on the left goes into the box and whatever's on top of the box also goes in. And if that's the case, here's what I'm going to get in my first quadrant. X capital R, X lowercase r. In my next one, X lowercase r, Y. In my next quadrant, X capital R, X lowercase r. And then in my last quadrant, X lowercase r and then Y. So now I need to look at what is the probability of producing an unaffected son. So I'm only looking at boys. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of all the boxes that are representative of daughters. So if we look here, I have two boxes. We're looking for an unaffected son, which means that we're looking for a capital R. Well, unfortunately, when we look here, it is impossible for this parent combination to have any male children that have normal color vision. All of their children will have red-green color blindness. So the percentage or the likelihood of this happening is 0%. All right, we finally got into our last word problem. It's asking, what is the probability of an unaffected woman, so she does not have it, and a man with hemophilia A producing children who are carriers of the disease? And again, probability, we're looking for percentage. So I'm going to go ahead and set up my key. So my key for affected because remember, hemophilia is a recessive disorder. So to be affected by hemophilia, I'm going to use H's, and I'm going to say it's a lowercase h. If you are unaffected, it's going to be X with a capital H. So let's go ahead and figure out what our parents are. So parent number one is a woman, so I know she's going to be XX. And it says that she's unaffected, and unaffected means that she has to have two capital H's. She's unaffected and not a carrier. Parent number two I know is going to be dad, so it's going to be XY, but it says that he actually has it. And to have it means that he's going to have a lowercase h. And we're not going to do anything here because remember the Y doesn't really do a whole lot. Now let's go ahead and throw our parents into our Punnett square. I'm going to put parent number one across the top. And then I'll put parent number two across the side. And just a reminder, one last time, whatever's on the left goes into the box and whatever's on top goes into the box. So that means in our first box, I'm going to have X, big H, X, little h. Second box, X, big H, X, little h. And along the bottom, I'm going to have um, X, capital H, Y, and then X, capital H, Y. And what I'm trying to do is determine if we can make carriers, and carriers, remember, are heterozygous. So another thing to remember is that males cannot be carriers. And if males can't be carriers, that means I can go ahead and get rid of all of my boys on my Punnett square. I don't even have to pay attention to them. So instead, I only have to pay attention to the top two quadrants. And if we look, they're both heterozygous, which means that they do not themselves have the disorder, but they are capable of giving the disorder or carrying the disorder to the next generation. So we have 25 and 25, and when we add them up, the answer to this question is... 50%.